Eileen Miyoko Smith, can you talk about the changing of what is considered acceptable radiation limits at the schools? Yes, uh, there's been a, a, a big fight. Um, the Fukushima uh, residents, the parents, came down in busloads to Tokyo on March on March, uh, excuse me, May 23rd. Uh, and met with the Ministry of Education. Uh, the whole building was encircled by people, completely encircled, and these negotiations went on um, inside the building. Um, it was very intense, uh, and the parents made the ministry say that they would aim for returning um, to back down to the one millisievert standard as much as possible, compared to the 20-fold increase that they were allowing in Fukushima Prefecture for the children. These levels that they have been allowing, um, it's officially still um, in place. There are huge levels. Uh, 20 millisieverts is is much higher than what triggers a radiation controlled area inside nuclear power plants. Uh, for example, in Japan, um, workers have been uh, recognized for compensation getting leukemia or whatever as low as five, a little bit over five millisieverts. And this standard for children is fourfold that um, annually. Anyway, um, we demanded that um, it be brought down as close to one. They res they agreed, and then it turns out that what they're saying is just during the time they're at school, they can reach that maximum one. So, of course, you know, the child's life is at school, going to and from school, et cetera. So the, the government is still allowing very high levels for children. Uh, Bob Alvarez, I'd like to ask you about this problem that the public confronts uh, of governments uh, misrepresenting or sometimes actually lying to the public in terms of when these major disasters occur. I mean, going back from Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl, most recently the BP spill in the Gulf or the collapse of the Twin Towers and the uh, health effects uh, for the public, and now here we have in Japan the tendency of government always to uh, to withhold information that they immediately have uh, from the public. Uh, doesn't this uh, eventually lead to just general mistrust uh, of people to what the government is saying in these disasters? Oh, yes, of course. I think the, the nuclear industries, uh, particularly in the United States and elsewhere, Russia, Japan, uh, have a very long history of withholding information and misleading the public about the hazards of their activities. And in this country, uh, it, it went on for many years. And uh, uh, you know, during the open air bomb testing program, for example, uh, these, the nuclear industry enjoys this rather unique status because of its uh, origins in the nuclear weapons program. And that uh, it's a system that has been fostered under conditions of secrecy, isolation, and privilege. And they do not consider it uh, in their interest to be candid with the public. Uh, I used to work in the Energy Department for six years and was a former, I guess you would say, nuclear insider. And what the mindset that I encountered there was that they, the the people who were reluctant to reveal candid information about the nature of the hazards uh, from these activities was that we can't scare people. Scaring people is worse than telling them the truth. And I think that that's a fundamental, uh, uh, fundamentally wrong-headed assumption. Bob Alvarez, how do you respond to the U.S. nuclear ind industry saying it doesn't expect any health problems among uh, Japanese people um, as a result of the nuclear accident? I just think that's arm waving. It's public relations arm waving because we won't know what the full truth will be for decades to come. Uh, we do know that based on past uh, uh, accidents such as Chernobyl, such as uh, the experience we've had with our nuclear workers in this country over the last 50 years, is that uh, there's bound to be a significant increase in the risk of cancer and most likely other diseases. And you say Japan is equal to or worse than Chernobyl, the Fukushima Daiichi plant? That's correct, because if uh, this, the Soviet Union and Russia 
basically have claimed that about 50 million curies of radioactivity were released to the environment. Uh, this is roughly comparable to what the Japanese government has currently admitted, and that this site continues to release significant amount of radiation in the environment. Nowhere near as large as, as it did uh, during the first week or two, but it's still quite significant. Uh, the other issue here is the workers on the site. I was astounded to learn that some 5,000 workers have positive evidence of internal exposure to radioactive, r radioactive materials. This is a huge number of people to be exposed over such a short period of time. Uh, in uh, in the, the U.S. nuclear weapons program, which operated uh, at, at a sort of a brisk pace for nearly 50 years, uh, this is roughly comparable to what all workers at nuclear weapons sites during that period were recorded to have received from internal exposures. Uh, I think that the, uh, the impact on the workforce, the emergency responders, uh, is going is, is something we need to watch very closely because that's going to give us some important clues of what we might expect in terms of the health consequences to the public. And, and yet, Eileen Miyoko Smith, uh, some of the reports that we've had here, the news reports say that that uh, there's no trouble recruiting people to go and work in, on the cleanup uh, because of the obviously the high pay that they're offering and and also the economic dislocation that occurred as a result of the of the tsunami uh, and of the nuclear accident itself. Yes, that's correct, uh, and we're very concerned uh, for the health of the workers. And as Bob Alvarez pointed out. Um, the uh, now the knowledge that so many workers have received internal exposure. Uh, this is also a concern for the public, and citizens are very concerned about that. The Japanese government refuses to recognize any potential internal exposure of the residents of Fukushima. Uh, we've been addressing this about the children. Uh, citizens have demanded whole body counts. Um, a few have actually been able to get them. Uh, at the Atomic Bomb um, Research Institute and are refused the results. They're just told um, no problem. They don't, aren't given the data and they're demanding um, that the data be released. Um, so that is a great concern. And the other thing I want to point out is this is still an ongoing accident. That issue about the spent fuel pool that Bob Alvarez addressed in the U.S. Uh, at Fukushima, as you know, Unit 4 is uh, there with that exposed uh, spent fuel pool. Uh, we're concerned about possible aftershocks. Uh, there are people that are still living 12 miles outside of the radius of the plant. Uh, there are only hot spots that have been evacuated outside of um, that larger area of, of 20, 30 kilometers. And uh, that's why we're demanding evacuation. And the demand has now become very clear, and we're pushing for that to happen, Bob, especially for pregnant women and young children. Bob Alvarez, nuclear power globally. The U.S. says it's moving forward. But Germany, uh, uh, Angela Merkel has been forced to turn back on that, and they say they're not going to move forward with nuclear power plants. Same with Switzerland. Saudi Arabia says they're going to build 30 new nuclear power plants. Well, as I said, Plans and statements and announcements oftentimes are different from what actually happens. Uh, the fact of the matter in the United States is that we no longer have any companies or capabilities or infrastructure to build nuclear reactors. We have to depend on nations such as Japan and France to do that. Uh, for Japan is the uh, right now uh, the only producer of. Uh, of uh, forgings for reactor vessels. Uh, nuclear engineers in this country are almost like uh, Confederate war veterans. There are very few uh, actual U.S. Uh, citizens who go to college to become nuclear engineers because it's considered a dead-end occupation. So uh, we don't really have the infrastructure, uh, the skilled knowledge base that we need to have a uh, any significant expansion of nuclear power is not there. Uh, and I think that the Fukushima action, accident has really had uh, a major body blow to the world nuclear industry. You have to understand that Japan, with its 54 reactors, 
represents the third largest uh, number of reactors of any uh, of a country in the world. They're number three. And for, for the Japan now to announce that it's going to shut down its reactors by, by next spring, albeit perhaps for temporary reasons, is a major signal uh, to other countries who are either, who either have a large reactor fleet uh, or those who are contemplating building more. I think Saudi Arabia's desire to have 30 reactors uh, uh, is uh, something that's not necessarily going to be easily achievable uh, because of uh, the fact that the United States and other, uh, serves essentially as a gatekeeper for any such deal of that nature. Uh, I think that Saudi Arabia is looking to establish a nuclear infrastructure in order to allow it to have the capability down the road to have nuclear weapons. Uh, building 30 reactors in Saudi Arabia in a country which really doesn't have much water to speak of, and reactors are extremely uh, uh, water intensive, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and then if you look at the price tag for building these reactors in a place like Saudi Arabia, uh, you're looking at an expenditure of somewhere between three to five trillion dollars to do this. So um, I think some of this, uh, some of these announcements and plans are just what they are, announcements and plans. Uh, and finally, on Vermont, because it could become the first legislature in the country to shut down a nuclear power plant, the Vermont Yankee plant, but Entergy, the owner, is fighting hard, trying to sue them to stop them from doing this. Uh, the comparison of Vermont Yankee to the Fukushima plant. Well, the Vermont Yankee is, it, plant is a General Electric boiling water Mark I reactor, which is the exact same design as those at the Fukushima Daiichi site. Uh, it, has, uh, uh, it has more radioactivity in its spent fuel than all of the spent fuel rods at the four troubled reactors, wrecked reactors, uh, at Fukushima. Uh, it's uh, 42 years old. Um, and this is a reactor which uh, I think uh, whose time has come to close. Uh, it's, uh, it should not be looked upon as just a, a, uh, an ATM machine uh, for a multi-tiered holding company that uh, makes sure that, that uh, uh, it can make as much money as possible. You know, this reactor was purchased uh, for pennies on the dollar. Uh, and uh, companies like Entergy, who operate in these deregulated environments, are loath to do things that would require significant safety upgrades. For example, if the state required them to build cooling towers uh, and comply with the Clean Air Act and to really build new modern ones, I think the capital expenses alone would drive energy to shut down that reactor. Uh, so um, I think that, that the battle lines are drawn there, uh, and I think that we're, we're going to see an increasing uh, uh, battle between states uh, who appear to be on a collision course with the federal government over the future of nuclear power. We want to thank you very much for being with us, Robert Alvarez, former senior policy advisor to U.S. Secretary of Energy, now a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies. His new report is called Spent Nuclear Fuel Pools in the U.S. Reducing the Deadly Risks of Storage. We'll link to that at democracynow.org. And Eileen Miyoko Smith, thank you so much for being with us again, this time from Tokyo. She is executive director of the group Green Action. This is Democracy Now! Stay with us.